Um, so welcome to our first COP of the year. Um, Michael and I have been uh, spending time over the last two years trying to talk about how to how to change our COP into an interactive COP one because it's it's much more about helping people um, implement either technological components in how they teach in their individual classroom or at sometimes in their lives as well as in their teaching and the, the different levels that each individual wants. So we wanted it to be as discourseful as we could create, where we have people that have experts speaking on a field and uh, creating a discourseful environment. However, as we all know, large groups in discourse in Zoom is complex, right? Because everybody has a hard time getting cut off and all this nature. So what we've decided to establish is a kind of um, a format where we'll have a person proctoring and sort of running the, the sessions. And then we'll have you guys in the chat able to ask questions and the person running will be following the questions and ask your questions and you're typing in. That way we're not asking the same questions over and over again and different things. And you all get to type in and even um, sharing things. So that way, as, and if there's a dry spot in any of the questions you ask, I have questions pre-prepared that can help generate other questions and help it go along. And so that's kind of the format we're gonna try through this year in our COP as a change to create a, an actual participating communicative environment. Um, we did it at the end last year and it seemed to go really well. A lot of people put a lot of questions in for a speaker. It allowed for an organic interaction to happen. So it, it worked well. What we're looking to do this time for the first COP is to help anybody with this transition from pre-COVID instruction to COVID instruction to post-COVID instruction. And so Michael, as our resident IT guy, um, is gonna kind of give us, at the, as a beginning, what he had, he's gonna pick a course, how he taught it pre-COVID, what he did to augment it during COVID, and now that he's going and he gets to have the option of students in class, what is he keeping, what is he changing, future-wise? Where is he going with some of his learning from having to alter his teaching style um, during, after COVID? So as he's doing that, feel free to ask questions about things going on in your own classrooms, questions about how you wanna generate things instructions, because we don't know everybody's teaching environment. Some of you still might be <coughs> in a COVID scenario where you have to be distant and you previously were, previously were not distant and you might have questions. How do you think I could augment this or alter this? Um, and you might have questions of things I could implement. So as he's telling this part, put questions that you have, because we thought this would be the best way to start our COP this year. Like, what can we do to help you guys implementing technology and really, you know, in this COVID era, digital, like having to not teach in person, as a format and what can be copped, what can't be, different stuff. So with that in mind, I'm gonna let Michael kind of give you his brief, what he did before, um, what he changed and then where he's going forward. And you can take questions as he's talking. So go ahead, Michael. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Yeah, that's a, the, the softball question to start off with. What did I do in the past? I. So I, I've, I've taught a few different classes over the years, but probably the one I teach most recently is a class called Technology and Society. And Technology and Society is a, a workshop style class and, and it's evolved over the years. It used to be lectures and shoots. Now it's a three hour workshop where I stand up the front and I do some, some lecturing, but I also get the students involved in either discussing things with me as a class or alternatively discussing things as small groups as well. So I would, I, we would, I, organize the class to be in one of the collaborative meeting spaces. You, you guys might know them, the ones with all the moo cows on the edges, right? Those little machines. I, I don't know if it's just our admin guys that call them moo cows or whether this is a CQ university thing. Um, but, uh, but we put them in those rooms on purpose. So then what happens is by default, the students get gathered around tables. You end up with half a dozen students at each table at half a dozen different tables, you know? 
And I would use those groups to enable students to kind of discuss things as a group and bring them back to the, the audience. And so that was kind of the way my teaching had evolved to a point where I then went, okay, I'm happy with this. I, I don't mind the way this class works. And you, and, um, and then, yeah, Nick said, okay, now we've got to do everything online. Okay. You've got to do this all online now. And, and, and I went, Oh, well, how am I going to do these classes online? And, uh, and in particular, you know, online is a great leveler in some ways uh, because you know you, you don't have the kids at the front of the class and the kids at the back of the class and the ones that are really anxious about speaking out in this in this room environment with 20 you know or 30 other eyes sharing staring at them at the same time but it's also a little bit daunting i think for these students when there's 30 or 40 of them in a room together for this workshop and they they so they do know there are those other voices other people listening in so I had to work out how to kind of reconstruct those classes and it was challenging. I, I remember for the entirety of term one last year kind of go, how am I going to run my classes in term two? How am I going to do this? And uh, some of the stuff I tried worked really well and some of the stuff didn't work so well. And in the end, I kind of leaned towards uh, trying to keep my basic pedagogy, my basic approach to the classes the same but working out a way that I could actually uh, make it work online. And that involved using breakout rooms and it involved breaking the students into sort of these, these automatic groups, but it also involved using tech uh, in ways that I'd previously done things face to face, like, you know, uh, using the participants tab in, in Zoom to allow students to vote things up and down, say, do you agree or do you disagree with this? And I used to do that in class by getting them to put their hands up in the air, you know? So, so I tried to replicate what I was doing, but also the technology required me to make some adjustments to what I was doing as well. And, um, and ultimately, as Robert has touched on, and I think as our university has touched on as a whole, we now have had two terms of doing this and we're now having heads of courses and the vice chancellor to a certain extent now coming back to us and saying, well, now that you're going to go back to face to face teaching in term one, what, what are you going to keep out of this? Are you going to keep this? Are you going to just revert back? And I've had a lot of people say to me that they think that a lot of professors are just biding their time waiting until they can finally get back to standing in the classroom with the chalk duster and the tweed jacket and the, you know, and, and all that stuff. Right. But I'm not sure if that's true. I think some of us have sort of gone, well, there's, there's some value in what I've done. Like one of the things that's gone, that's happened for me is that um, I've automatically got all of these recordings of every single class. And so I find myself less inclined to repeat myself in subsequent classes and instead say to my students, well, if you want to know about that, go and look at week 10. I talk about it in the beginning of week 10. It's there in the recording. And I, I recorded my classes beforehand, right? I've always recorded my, well, for a few years, I've recorded my classes, but something about it being the recording like this just makes it so much easier for me to refer them back to those sort of, those pieces of pre-cooked kind of content that are, that are on the website. It's not, it's, it becomes lesser a recording of the lecture for those that missed it and more a resource if you want to know more about what we the, the topic we talked about in week four and i found that a really interesting difference for me um but yeah i think as academics we're going to now be asked to do this in term one we're going to revert back to face to face nominally face to face but i know that in some schools they've said things like well we're only going to have one lecture going forward and you're just going to run them centrally and it's only going to be the sheets that are going to be split up now. And in other schools, they're talking about trying to make everything stay online and, and have very little student interaction. So I think, um, you know, it's going to be interesting for us to work out what we can port over. And I guess that's what Robert's saying is hopefully we can, we can help you think about that and how that technology is being used. Oh, you're on mute. In order to kind of share my class, my units that I teach have always been distance. So I was distant pre-COVID. So nothing changed for me um, when COVID happened and I'm still there. And one of the uh, styles I have it kept that I, I promote is there for like, at least 15 years, this concept of, you know, flipping the classroom has been a construct, um, which 
I think traditionally it's just a new language for having kids read and prepare. But the, the video component allows kind of for an altered flip to classroom. On my unit, I actually have all my, um, I have videos of me talking about key points to focus on the articles, key areas to look at. And then when they come to the two, which is now me in a Zoom scenario, I take questions that's more about the content. So I have more ability to flip the classroom in that I also get to put a video of teaching where there is an integration of questioning and interacting in my Zooms opposed to teaching in my Zooms. Um, now, there is some problems with that, right? Because culturally flipping the classroom is something the students have to adapt to. And sometimes some do and sometimes some don't. And that ends up being something you have to create in your own Zooms, a culture of flip to classroom. And that becomes hard because my classes are large. I have 150 students in my class. And I'll routinely only have 30 students show up to a Zoom of my 150. And then I'll have 50 that watch the Zoom later. So to help those 50, I actually have a separate chat board, which are questions for the Zoom. So that if you can't attend the Zoom time, you type all these questions in, and I go over the questions in the Zoom. And that's something I've brought forward, and I think is something that uh, we could try to bring forward of this flipping the classroom as a format. Um, Michelle Gray says, um, what are your thoughts on how the students found the changes? Do you have feedback from students on how they transitioned into online from on campus? And do students want to go back to face-to-face? I ask me again in about six weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, once we get halfway into term one, I mean, my anecdotal reaction is they seem to quite like it. And, and in fact, the industry as a whole seems to have, um, have, have sort of said students are actually really enjoying this, this flexibility of being able to just dial in from home and not have to make that, that long commute or, or whatever it might be. So I think generally, I think, I, I think students will, will kind of embrace this idea. Uh, but I have had conversely students saying that they feel a little bit more disconnected. Does that mean they're actually going to come to lectures though? Or does that just mean they're going to come to you know, office hours or try and sort of connect with you in some other fashion? I'm not sure. But I, I think, yeah, I think the anecdotal evidence I've seen so far is that they don't necessarily want to go back to face-to-face. To -face. They, they want to be in Australia, but they don't necessarily want to go face-to-face. What is interesting to answer that question from my point of view is what my students tell me, because my class never switched, it's always, they compare my class to their other in-person classes that they take. And that's the kind of conversation I will get. And one of the things that I've observed that in the conversations is because of our academic system, having unit coordinators and lecturers, the students seem to find less variety, right? Or when I say variety, but less change. Whereas one, un one lecturer at one place will speak one way and, uh, and talk about the content one way. And then another lecturer at a different location will focus on the curriculum differently. And one of the things they talk about is, I'm the only one, like I'm the unit coordinator and the lecturer. So when they ask questions or when students from one location interact with a question, they're all interacting with one person. And that a lot of students have talked about liking that and that they don't have to read each lecture different. What I found was uh, how students from completely different locations are in communication with each other because they're in the same course, but they have different lecturers all the time. And they're actually talking to each other behind the scenes about the difference in the lecturers in their area for any course they're taking. But Amy had mentioned that that was a good point um, what I, that, that Michelle made about do the students like it, right? And one proposition might be is that the larger your class is, what you're going to find is some students is invariably will like one better and the other better, uh, opposed to not what do they like better, but what's better for instruction. So that leads me to Michael, how did you, in your um, COVID time, switch to letting students be discourseful with each other? Did you use breakout rooms? Um, did you find there was a way to create student conversation? 
Uh, that was challenging, yes. The, um, it's always been challenging in my classes because even when you have them face to face sitting around the tables, you have some students who will, who will comment on every question and you'll have some students that are sitting in the corner very quiet, you know, very, you find much more difficult to actually engage in the class. And the way I used to break it in the face to face class is by, is by allowing those small groups to interact. So even though the, the, the shy student in the corner might not interact in class, they at least interact with the smaller group and, and their, feed, their, their feedback is still sort of contributed to that group, even though that group might have, might have the most, uh, you know, overt person as the actual representative or the speaker for the group. Um, so we did something similar with the breakout rooms when we um, came on, when we came online. Something really interesting I noticed with breakout rooms though, and I'd be interested in other people's experiences with this was that uh, when I used to do face-to-face -face breakouts in small groups around tables in a room, one of the things you can do as a teacher is you can wander around and, and sort of very sneakily sort of listen in to how the conversation is going at those tables. And I don't think students realise we do it, but I think a lot of us as teachers do. You'll just sort of wander around the room and you'll stand near that table, you just listen into what they're saying and maybe, you know, contribute a sentence or two to try and, you know, try and drive them a little bit. Um, but then... I tried to do that in breakouts and what I found is that as soon as I came into the breakout room, they all stopped talking. Michael's here. Yeah, and they, they just stopped because it's so obvious that I've arrived and they, oh, well, we better not talk because we're waiting for him to talk instead. And so I actually found that I had to, um, yeah, I had to stay away from the breakout rooms on online. I couldn't go into the rooms. I had to just let them be um, and then just ask them. But they knew they were responsible to tell me what had happened to the breakout rooms when they when they got back. Um, but yeah, to answer your broader question, Robert, I, 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 this course has never been a massive issue for me in my units and it did go the same way online as it did face to face, which is that in asking the students the questions and in getting them to interact in the breakout rooms, I would get students that, um, that, that, that were willing to make comments and that would learn to, to connect with each other. And to your point, there was actually value in the online classes and I found this face to face when I used to connect various campuses together. So I'd have Brisbane campus and I'd be in Brisbane, but hands would be dialed in, you know, uh, that they'd all kind of work as a single cohort. And I got towards the end of the term where students in Brisbane would say, like Craig said in Cairns, and you'd be like, yeah, he actually knows the name of a student in Cairns and he's referencing the point that student made. And that actually worked much better online because they were all together in the one room. And so they did get to know each other and Alex and, you know, various other students in my class, Ellis, I can name a few of my uh, best year, Rory this term. They, they knew each other and, and they knew each other's points of view and what they might say and what they might. So that discourse was, was okay in Zoom, but it does take a bit of work to get them comfortable to, to talk to each other. Hermini, uh, or Hermine, I'm her, uh, terrible, Herna, I'm terrible at reading names. Um, she asked, how do we, how do you tell how many students to view the record recorded lectures? And in um, uh, Firefox or um, Chrome, you can actually turn the tracking on and what it'll do is show you which students have viewed it. Now, when you say the term viewed, it means they clicked on it. They could actually let it run and you'd ever so too. So you don't a hundred percent know, but in the Moodle, and when you turn that tracking on, it'll tell you every click button that's on there. Now, the, um, depending on how you create your videos, right? So I upload my videos to um, YouTube and then put them into YouTube. So they're live frames within YouTube. And I do it that way because I find students won't click the video. But if my face shows up, they watch it, right? Because if you just highlight words and now that words are click here, less people tend to do it. So I have my face showing up and they click it. Now that's untrackable because it goes through YouTube and you can't track those videos. But any click that you put in that they click, they can track. So that, that would be how you tell if they have you record. Like all my Zooms in my, I have a, a forum called Zoom videos. They're all clicked to get to them. Mm. Um, opposed to my videos, which are with the articles. So I don't know how many people watch those. So before you move on from that topic, yeah, so Moodle, Moodle activity yeah. tracking is one way. So did they click the link on your Moodle website? Um, and then what, if you're recording via Zoom, I've put a link in the chat for Zoom for you to go and get a report 
on on how many students attended your actual Zoom class. So you can see, you know, this this thing that I did had 33, this meeting or whatever had 33. And then if it then goes across to Echo, either automatically or you download it and push it back up to Echo. Once it's on Echo, you can get analytics. And actually there is value in, in putting it in Echo for the analytics because you can actually see um, how students, when students drop away to Robert's point, you know, they dialed in for the first 20 minutes and then they left again, Echo will actually tell you those kinds of things. You know, what part of your lecture was most attended? Where was the bit that the students actually were, were listening in? Um, and so I, I use the Echo stats a bit to see which ones my students interacted with more. And it's always week four, which is the one that covers the first assignment. It's the most popular of my 12 uh, lectures. And then, yeah, as Alan says in the comments, uh, if you've got a YouTube, depending on what YouTube account you've got, if you put it on YouTube, you should be able to go into YouTube and at least see how many people clicked it. Uh, the only problem is if you put it on YouTube, that's, yeah, that's views. It's not necessarily students because it doesn't know student numbers. Uh, so it's not what we call unique views. It's right. views overall. Um, Michael, what are In addition, you if you keep the same video for a period of time, like if you, you, if you make a new video every term, then you got it tracked. But if you use a, a video from two terms, you won't know the separate from terms in YouTube. Sorry, go ahead, Hannah. Somebody was just asking a question. It was Hannah for following. I, uh, I have, for my online students, I have a weekly lecture. I record that and then I um, put it in Echo 360, create a link, and then I email them the link so that they, I don't put that on Moodle. So how would I track that in Echo mm. 360? If you go to Echo and you click on the class and then up the top there's a button, that, there's a tab for analytics and you can get the analytics for every, because what you, when you put it into Echo, I assume, I assume you create a, what they call a class in Echo and you've got workshop one, workshop two, workshop three, workshop four and each of those has a video attached to it or, or lecture one, lecture two, whatever you call them, yeah? So then you should then be able to click, once you go into that class, you should be able to click analytics up the top and that'll tell you how many students have watched workshop one, how many have watched workshop two. And as I said, once it's in Echo, you can actually see like when they dropped off and there's a bit of other, there's some better stats in there. Um, if, you, if you're doing Zoom, just as a little extra hint, Hannah, um, if you're doing Zoom, you can actually get them to record it for you automatically. If you talk to Mike Gregory, They'll get recorded automatically and you can even get them to push it across to Echo for you automatically. And when Mike Gregory worked out how to do that for me, I was so excited because I was doing what you were doing. I was Zooming it and then um, downloading the recording from Zoom via the link that they emailed me and then uploading it back up to Echo. And I said to Mike Gregory, this is stupid. I'm downloading it from CQU and then uploading it back to CQU. Can't you guys just transfer the file? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, Mike Gregory's your guy to sort that out. Now, as an, just to add to that as an instructional difference, I do it the other way that, because I find a lot of my students will want to ask questions that they're not recorded on before mm -hmm. and after. And um, I, al I don't always have a tendency to stick at the exact time, right? Because if you, if you do it with them, they'll start the recording at a time and they'll end the recording at a time. So if you're not done, they're going to end it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I've, I have found, I, I always get, after my, I've stopped the recording, I'll get at least 10 to 15 minutes of more questions that somebody didn't want to ask because they did not feel safe asking a question in front of 150 people. Because what ends up happening is everybody in my course knows 150 are watching and that they're now recorded. Um, and I, I do find that anonymity of not being in the recording will get you a different thing, which is why I don't do that timed recording the way Michael does. So I, I get a lot of those questions, specifically because my class is teaching them literacy and numeracy skills. And there's a lot of people that don't feel comfortable asking some math questions that they think they should know. And they don't want to look like in a video that they don't know like what six times three is, right? Because they feel they're really unconscious, self-conscious about their math skills. So I find that helps. Um, now going back to the previous breakout rooms, it was interesting because there was a, uh, a informal sharing debate, right? Where Michelle mentioned that she found giving the students specific tasks and only giving them five to seven minutes um, worked because if they had too long, they would lose control. 
and Lee not be interested. And then Amy Johnson mentioned that she didn't use them because the students just didn't come back. So it'd be interesting to see if Amy gave a specific focus as Michelle did, and if she said only five minutes, um, and to see if that alters some of the interactions. One of the hard parts about integrating modern technology as a format, right? The reality is a student has the ability to sit in a classroom for an hour, just like you're gonna now sit here for an hour. However, they consume technology in a TikTok format that we are now having to adapt to. And so a lot of people are making the recording shorter, but a lot of them, right? You know, so that it fits into a setup uh, tension span at the place they're at at the time. And so it would be interesting if you can control and turn those breakout rooms into shorter times with a direct focus, will you get them back? Um, versus just go to the breakout room. Because I, I, I have found when I use breakout rooms, I have to be very specific and say be back with this time. And one of the things you can also add is if you make the content relevant to part of their assessment in the class, they will come back to find out if it was good or not because it will be in the assessment. So what you can do is let them break it out and then make it be part of something that they would be putting in the assessment so that they come back to check to see if it's a set good enough for the assessment and bring them back. Uh, we do have a culture that revolves around, is what you're teaching in the assessment? Because if it's not, I don't know how much value I have in it. I, uh, you know, the five to seven uh, minutes from Michelle I found really interesting because I actually, um, I originally started with 10 minute breakout rooms. Again, I was just mucking around. This is the first time I ever had to do it in turn two. So I just tried a few different things. I started with 10 minute breakout rooms and then I started to run out of time in my class. And so I tried to reduce my breakouts for my students to five minutes. And I got the feedback, Michelle, that they didn't have enough time. They, by the time they kind of dove in and talked to each other and introduced themselves and said hello, by then they'd used up some of that time. And so they actually asked me specifically to make it, to give them at least 10 minutes again. Um, so I thought that was really interesting, but I agree, you have to give them a very specific task. And I found that you have to give them a very specific task and work out how to make sure they know, remember what that is. So I, I found over time, I would give them questions on the PowerPoint slides, but then I'd have to actually copy those questions into the chat because when they got to the breakout room, they couldn't see my PowerPoint slides anymore. And so they just, they drifted, right? But if I put them in the chat, then that reminded them all of what the, because the chat stays stays there as they go into the breakout room. So it's it's kind of like you, you've got this, this tech, you know, that you're trying to do the same pedagogical practice, but you have to make adjustments and things for, for the tech. So um, I'll, I'm gonna make a pedagogical comment before I get to Gabriel's, uh, Gabrielle's question, which is great. Um, pedagogically, you have to sort of think about an implementation of a framework in a concept of multiple times, not once, like let's do a breakout. So what would happen is um, your first breakout might be a little bit room, be a little bit longer because they're introducing themselves. And then you let you break out multiple times in a class. So each one then can get shorter because there's no reintroduction of each other hmm. um, or one long one if you can do, uh, do it each time. But if you actually expect it to work, the one time you use it, it won't because it needs to be practiced. So you need to say pedagogically, eh, like think about what we just did for this thing. We say we're going to start this where people are going to type questions in there. Well, the first time it's going to be weird and someone's going to want to talk, right? But the more we do it, the more the pedagogy will develop itself um, and the more we'll find out it works. We won't know after one workshop, is this format right? So. You have to go, in this class, we're gonna do breakouts for the whole term. We'll break out every time in each class. And then what happens is you have a similar format of what you expect from them. That will get, they'll get used to that format and it'll run smoother. If you change the format of your breakouts every time you go in, it's gonna be chaotic every time because the framework will be so different for them. They're not gonna function as well in what is expected of them, right? So, and I would argue, knowing Michael's class and knowing Michelle's class, right? If Michelle, Michael is having them go into a breakout room to have a philosophic conversation, and Michelle's having them go into a breakout room to do a task, 
you're gonna get completely different responses. So I keep seeing in the type, oh, I, they loved it. Oh, they disliked it. Oh, this and that. A lot of it is gonna have to do with what did you have them do in the breakout room? Um, because if you go back into your own pedagogical experience, you'll find you've been in classes where you hated group work and you've been in classes where you love group work. It's, it's not the group work as much as it's what did the instructor do in the group work? How clear were the roles of everybody in the group so that you enjoyed that group work scenario? And, and you can kind of see that happening. So, so you want to think about those things Go Amy ahead, pulled that out. Amy pulled. Amy did pull that out. She said, "I think part of the problem is that nobody else in my, in my other units that are the students are doing does break out of the rooms the way I do." So she, they hadn't had as much practice, and she found that you know they weren't as well versed with breakout rooms. So you're right. Consistency is really important. My my class is the same every every week of the twelve weeks. This, the questions are on a particular slide. It's called the "What are your thoughts?" slide. It has a red, you know, so they know they're coming right. And when they see the "What are your thoughts?" slide, they know that I'm going to probably ask them to interact with me in some way, or send them away to breakout rooms or something. So yeah, I think that's that is really important because they do need the practice, right? I also wanted to call out that Amy uh, mentioned students in cars and you know expecting to listen in. I've also had students that are at work that dial in and that kind of goes back to what Michelle Gray was saying earlier. Do you think students are going to want to come back to face to face? I have had students dialing in that are clearly sitting in their car after work. I've had students where when they open their microphone, you can see here the dishes, you know, in the background. So I, I wonder whether that to Michelle Gray's initial question, whether that will mean that students kind of buck against the face-to-face -face classes because they'll ultimately go, well, it's just not as convenient as what I was able to do online. You know, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I'm just giving that little bit of anecdote, the evidence that I've also seen them in the cars and at the, at the work and things like that. So. In addition, it will be also based on your courses, your schools, uh, because so in the School of Education, uh, Arts and Education, and on the education side, um, you know, secondary is run very different than primary and elementary. So secondary after your second, after your first year, all the classes are distance. And the argument is the students tend to like it. Elementary, the students want to interact. They want to be doing more group stuff. So the course, the, the, each course is different, right? So I, when I first came to Australia, wanted to learn about like, what is an, a CQ student? So I just kind of hung out in the computer labs where that, at my campus, where the students all were. None of the IT guys ever wanted to attend a class ever. They were like, this is, they would never go to lectures. They would never attend lectures. They would all just be sitting in the computer labs, watching stuff, reading stuff. And that was their part of the curriculum related to what they were and what they were doing. But my, I, I also met all the physio people and all the physio people went to every class and they love and they hated any class that was online, right? And so one of the things to consider and part of what you can ask us with questions is um, your curriculum alters either in your core unit or in the course itself, whether it's apply applicable to being online, right? Because the philosophy class tends to want to have more discourse, but you know, an intro to science, you know, biology class, just give me all the terms, I'll memorize them all um, in that kind of a format. What was interesting was the question I was gonna get back to was how to manage students' participation so they don't get sidetracked or important question comments are not missed. So I've been um, a lecturer for 16, 17 years now. Uh, I, I taught in America before I came here. And before Zoom existed, uh, we had Skype, but we didn't have video Skype. And um, I taught a master's program during summertime. And in America, uh, we're not employees in summer. So I can just do whatever. And they asked me to teach a grad class. And I said, I can't. I'm going to be in California. I'm not an employee. And they said, well, what if we let you do it any way you want from distance? So I said, OK, fine. So I just did the whole class on Skype. I couldn't see them. They couldn't see me. And I just talked. Right. And I found the instruction was unique because I ran it in a traditional lecture format. 
And every time I asked the question, I expected every student to type the answer. Whereas normally in a classroom scenario, what I would do is I would ask a question and um, whoever raised their hand, I would call on. And I went, no, now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna ask a question everybody had to type. And I would look and I would read names. And if somebody wasn't typing, I'd go, Mark, Mark, you know, like if they were interacting. So there, it can be interesting if you can open the chat and you run it in a discourseful format where you get students to type. And um, so I transitioned that format to my philosophy class. And what I did was, it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course. Uh, <clears throat> and so what happened, or unit, sorry, class unit. What happened was Monday and Wednesday was in person and Friday was online on, on Skype. My students loved it. They went nuts because it, they had to develop a, 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 a written intelligence over a verbal intelligence. They had to type questions to me about philosophy and um, they felt freer in nature writing them. And I got to actually assess their ability to understand the concept better than a, a verbal question they would ask. Um, and I ended up doing that hybrid for years because the students really did like, and um, it ended up being slightly freer, right? One, I could not see them. And you know how you all get basically, you know, Abdul's scenario right now, right? Where you just get a name written on the screen, it's all black. Your students don't even want to look at you. Um, but my mandate was, well, if I don't see you, you have to type something. And that is one way you can do it, right? Now, obviously, it's much harder if you have a class of 50 people in your Zoom. And that's part of the deal. All of these things alter based on the numbers and the situation. Like, I could seriously ask a question of all of you and do a pretty good job of making sure you all answer, right? And looking in the chat and having it open and keeping track of it. But it would be much harder for me to do that in class of if we added 10 more of you, uh, it would be really hard to do. So yeah, that's something that you can see with keeping track is having them. Um, but it's very hard. Uh, we, we talk about this notion of um, teaching in itself is a lot of things at once, right? You're, you're lecturing, but you're listening and you're watching students, you're seeing who's paying attention. Now that you have a chat on the side and you do it in a Zoom world, the concept of multitasking is crazy, right? Monitoring and like reading, because I'm having a harder time now just reading the questions. Once I get into answer a question mode, how do I also read the questions? And you start realizing that being as strong of an instructor in a digital format involves much more multitasking. Um, which is the benefit of me going, okay, Michael, now you say something so I can quickly read questions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Alan, Alan mentions that. Running off on uh, other people. Further up, he says, having a second person is great for this. And we did this. It's interesting, us as a case study, when we did this with Joe Orlando at the end of last year, we had the two of us, you were the moderator and I was able to help you sort of manage the chat. This time around, you're moderating and I'm, spe I'm speaking and that's making things a little bit different. So you learn from what you do. I want to draw, draw everyone's attention to Alan. Um, Alan and I know each other because Alan teaches uh, programming among other things. And so Alan, Alan picked up on this idea that his, some of his students are driving around in their car while they're listening to the lecture, the same as Amy's. And that really scares me because I want those students sitting in front of a computer actually practicing the programming, right? So either, either they're not and they're just doing the lecture, as Amy says, as a bit of a podcast, which I think is a waste of time for a programming class. I don't know why they're doing that. Or, or alternatively, and this is the nightmare scenario, left-hand side is the, is the phone, right-hand side is the computer. They've got Unity open on the laptop while they're Uber driving or something, which kind of scares me a little bit. Um, but I, yeah, I think Amy said it right. You need to set the expectations for the students. You need to let them know what's going on. And, and Alan drew our attention to that as well earlier when he mentioned using breakout rooms for one-on-one -on -one consultations. And I've done that too. I mentioned to you my ethics class, but I also taught programming this term, Alan. I taught um, mobile game development. And I've used breakout rooms as sort of impromptu consult rooms for students as well. That's, that's worked really well in my shoots um, where you say to the students, have you got a question? Do you want to talk to me individually? And you create a little manual breakout room, shuffle that student across, go and talk to him and just leave all the rest in the main room to work on whatever 
tutorial exercise you've given them at the time. Uh, and then for project management, it's, it's that to the extreme. I taught project management in term two and project management classes typically just involve meeting each project management group individually to see how their project is going. So those classes, the Zoom recording was, was a waste of time. It was just me picking up three students, shuffling across to a breakout room, coming back into the main room, picking up the next three students, shuffling across into a breakout room. And so the students, uh, it was a totally different format. But yeah, I, I, I just wanted to endorse what Alan said about using them for consultation. It, it does work really well as a mechanic. And again, that's an adaption because when I used to do it face to face, if a student had a programming issue, they just put up their hand, I went over to their computer and we just had sort of an informal consult in the room. We can't do that um, now, the way things are currently constructed. Uh, and Alan says he's heard indicators a few times during class. So at least they're using their indicators, Alan. At least that's, you know, mustn't be Queensland students if that's the case, Robert, yeah? <laughs> and to throw, because um, I've seen a lot of the comments, to throw a kind of a quantitative monkey wrench in. So um, before COVID, we had this thing happen in the School of Education. One term, one year, we went to our uh, school meeting and one person spoke about how many of the students wanted their classes to have little person-to-person -person interaction. Then the next year, one person spoke about how all their students want to have face-to-face -face occurrences. And what it made me want to ask both of them was, were they asking the students that were giving them the answers they wanted versus were they asking the entire class? So I'll explain what I mean. Both of them, I teach two units in term two. Both units have 150 students in it. And sometimes what happens to me is when my students come to the Zooms and there might be something in the pedagogy I do that they hate it, and they'll tell me, I don't know, I don't like this style. And one of the things I'll say, but you are 20 students of 150. I have to make sure that this, because if I listen to those 20 and I change the pedagogy, but there's 130 students watching my Zoom and they like the other feedback, the other pedagogy system better, I actually get, um, uh, like on my evaluations at the end of the unit, I get really bad scores because the 20 don't outweigh the 130 that aren't in the room. And I tell my students and I talk to my students in the Zoom about, I call it um, Zoom land and home land um, so that they understand that when I answer your question, I have to answer it in a way that somebody watching it at home would be able to interpret my answer, not just a conversation between you and me. Because I have two different audiences and I have to respect the audience that doesn't have. So I to explain this. You have a different feel when you're in person with a person, their body language, the human interaction. But there's also a separate feel with all of you right now in this Zoom room. That's a separate feel from just a recording of this Zoom. Like if you were to go back and we could record this and save it, and you were to come back two days later and just watch the recording, you could, or watch someone watch the recording, that would be better, and watch their reactions to everything we have. Because when Gabriella smiles just a little bit about something I say, it changes my reaction, makes me feel like I did something right, right? When Michelle, who's obviously my wife, when I see a frown on her face, I'm doing something wrong, right? And so each little thing you all do in the room alters what I do. However, the person that's never there, does, they don't get part of that interaction. They're not even looking at everybody else in the room to see why I'm changing. But we now all are in one shared space interacting that's different than what they see and i spend time uh actually multiple classes because what i found is they're not always the same people in every zoom explaining that there's this world and then there's that outer world that's watching me and this is part of that pedagogy um you have to consider because i keep seeing well once these students liked it but this student didn't and that most of the time we don't get feedback and the best example is my last unit there were four people in the Zoom that hated me. I hated me. I know, because in my feedback, everything they said, they typed exactly in the feedback. But I got a 4.7 uh, for the class, right? Because everybody in the Zoom world that was watching the videos liked it. 
I felt really bad until I got my evaluations. It was weighing on me. I'm not teaching well enough. The students aren't happy. It really affected me until I got the feedback. I was like so shocked I got such a high score um, because I didn't realize the other students were that way then. So that is something to think about is like the students that have a voice that you don't get to hear their voice until it's way past the point that you can change anything, right? Because they won't say anything if they're not in your Zooms and they're just watching in what one and we two and three, they'll say something at the very end, which means try to not evaluate yourself till you get to the very end because then you get the whole class comments and feedback. You know, and I got a lot of comments on how to make the videos that I do different, how to make them more entertaining, how to do these different parts from students that never spoke to me once in the course. Um, so Gabriel, um, Alan says, how do you get the reactions when most of the students will not turn on video? Um, you're actually asking a question that is a major part of pedagogy everywhere we go, right? Like. How do you get students to interact that are just staring at you, even if they're in person, right? Or, um, and what the reality is historically in pedagogy, right, is make whatever you're doing be part of the assessment and they will always interact, right? Everybody says, how do you find, historically in teaching, how do you get your kids to come prepared every day? Do pop quizzes, right? We all know if you, if you say there will be pop quizzes at any moment, any class, trust me, your students will show up knowing material. But it has to be, you know, you're asking how do you create a culture of people who want to learn and are invigorated in the class? And that's, there isn't a clear answer to that, right? You, you try different things, you'll try to be more motivating. Um, and there's different styles for different people. That's one of the things I think we act like there is a answer versus a lot of different answers for how you teach. Michael was going to say something. The video thing has been a big issue this last year. Um, that the, you see various different types of hot takes, Robert, about video, about students turning on their video. And you do see some people saying, I feel like I'm teaching to a blank screen. And teachers often comment how difficult it is. And then you see students saying, but I like being able to turn my video off because maybe I don't want them to know that I'm in the car driving Uber or I'm, I'm at work at the restaurant. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think the key for us with the video thing is to recognize that just because their, vi their video is off doesn't mean they don't want to engage in the class, right? So we're not really talking about how do we get students to turn their video on. It's about how do we get students to engage effectively with our class, even if we never get them to turn their video on. And I've just finished 12 weeks of teaching in my class. And there are students in my class that never turn their video on once in 12 weeks, but I, I feel like I know them. I feel like I know Rory. I could tell you about him, what his personality quirks are, who he is as a person, because he still interacted in my class uh, via audio, via typing in the chat, various other things. I could tell you I know Ellis and what Ellis is like as well for the same reason. I, there are students in that class that I know, feel like I know quite well. Um, and despite that, and you know what, that works both ways. I, I often tell an anecdote about meeting a student in the exam one day, and I'd never seen that student in my life. And he walks up to says, hi, Michael, and he shakes my hand, and he's very familiar with me. And I realize it's because he's watched 12 weeks of me in the video. So he feels like he knows me because he's watched 20 hours of me on the screen, even though I've never actually interacted with him. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's about building that connection anyway. But I think- Amy has- yeah. A great question on this notion, right? Amy says, how do we get our students to um, interact with each other in a sense of community? One of the things we'll have to adapt to in technology is how community is changing, mm. right? And it's really hard for me as a parent, right? My son used to have friends come over. Nobody comes over anymore. They all play first person games on their computer and their, they, their friend doesn't want to come to mind because they got to sit in back and watch him play. So he stays at, they live across the street and the kid's staying in his home, but that's his new community, right? That's how he chooses to um, define himself in his community that we have to try as all this stuff changes, right? Because I think if, if you grew up in, in my generation, my parents didn't understand why I wanted to talk on the phone. They were like, didn't you spend all day with these people at school? Why do you want to talk on the phone? 
And I know I never talked about anything important on the phone with my friends, but I wanted to call them as soon as I got home. And heaven forbid somebody tried to call while I was on the phone and do that double click and I got to click over, right? Um, and I just remember that long cord, you know, so you could walk around the kitchen and talk on the phone. And that was my community definition that was different than my parents. Like, why would you come home after school and call the kids? So we have to realize, and I think it's good to ask our students these questions about how they define their community, right? Because when I went to university, my whole first year, I never had a class under 150 people. I didn't know anybody in any of my classes that wasn't sitting right next to me yeah. uh, because it was the classes were too big. I got my community either in the dorms or other places and then in my final two years where my classes were smaller. And so when we talk about how do we create student communities, um, you try to help. And I like when the, um, I think it was Alan put, you can leave your chat room open, you can leave your class open so they can go and choose to create a community. Because we all know the experience where if you try to force community on your students, it gets even worse, right? You say, you will all be a community, but creating a place where the community can be organic can be one of the better ways. Yeah, I've, I've yet to crack. Over the years, I've tried to build discussion forums for distant students. And, and you're right, uh, Amy, Teams is the new one, right? The university's had Teams for the last couple of terms. And so now you can create an automatic team for your unit as well. I'm yet to crack it. I'm yet to really crack the ability. And Robert's right. I think a lot of it is because I tried to force community amongst my distance ed students and they just weren't that interested in interacting. I'm hopeful that maybe over the next couple of terms, I might be able to crack it because I've gotten, I feel I've gotten better at getting them to interact with each other in class to use the Zoom channel as a back channel like we're doing in this particular session as well, right? So you're, you get, they get to talk to each other informally and I'm hoping that that will then allow them to break the ice as it were so that they do know each other, like I said earlier. And then if we do give them a space, we don't, and we don't prescribe what they have to do in that space, but we simply say there is also a Teams available. Well, then Alex will answer questions that Rory has because Alex already knows Rory. You know, because they talk to each other in the chat or in the classroom. So I think Teams, though, Amy. So my answer to your question, Amy, what about how do we use Teams? Is I don't, I haven't, I haven't cracked it quite yet, but I think I'm getting there in terms of building those informal communities that Robert was just talking about. I think that's going to be Michael at um, Griffith for one of the programming subjects. We even set up Discord channels and stuff because that's where most of the students were. Yeah. The only thing is with that sort of thing, you need to be on at the time that people are asking the questions because they're looking for a fast turnaround mm. on stuff so that mm. you know, like you be on there at night and actually answer a few questions before you go to bed, just that you're getting that turnover. And yeah. once they found they were getting some responses, more questions started to come up as other people were on there going, oh, they're actually getting answers. And um, that, How that helped. Them interacting with each other though. You're, again, you're teaching the programming kids predominantly. I mean, do they interact with each other on the yeah. Discord? Okay, that's good, that's good. Yeah. You sometimes, you, once you get one question going, someone else comes in and then you'll, it took a bit for them to get used to it, but after a bit, they started answering each other's questions and you could sort of stand back and maybe just drop something in every now and then. But yeah, they did, did start going on their own. Mm, there you go. Well, that's good. That's good. And the other thing to remember is that a course can create community. Not every unit has to be a community creator within that unit, right? My unit's the best example. I teach literacy and numeracy across the curriculum. So what does that mean? I have science teachers, math teachers, English teachers, art teachers, PE teachers. I have HPE teachers. I've got vet teachers, right? These people don't want a community with each other. The English people don't really want a community with the math people and the science people and the, and the HPE people. So I found what ends up happening is they have their own sub communities within my unit, but my unit isn't the great place to create community because the math people feel distant from the English people and the English people don't like talking to the math people. Like it's like this whole dilemma in my unit. So, you know, not every unit has to be the community creator. 
And that's something to also, you know, consider so that you don't feel the pressure in your unit that everything must be done in it. Does that make sense? And I think sometimes as lecturers, we think of ourselves in our unit as the arbiter of everything. Instead of looking at the whole course and you know where, because our students create their best community when they're in their crack. Yeah, Amy said, fair point, Robert. Uh, maybe I'm worried about it, but the students are not, and I should be focused on discipline specific stuff. Um, I always have a tab to go over, but we're two minutes over and people are already dropping out. So we should uh, take any last little questions or anything to kind of wrap up. No one, <laughs> no one's typing questions. We're getting Michael, is there anything you... So, <laughs> um, no, uh, look, just to wind us up, ladies and gentlemen, um, Thank, if you do have any questions about technology and how to put technology into your class, please, please feel free to touch base with us. They, uh, I met with a group last week and they said, wow, this has been really useful. And we, we, we didn't feel like we could meet a software developer because we didn't have a spec. But now talking to you, we feel like we've got a spec. And I said, that's almost like that's what an educational technologist does, right? So if you've got any questions about ed tech and, and feel free to touch base with me and, and with Robert, we, we tend to work together a lot. Uh, and if I could really cheekily mention to all of you guys that there is voting open at the moment for the promotions committee. And there may be somebody on that list that you'd like to vote for. Uh, you know, um, and I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> so, okay, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Uh, and I'll let Robert wind up since he's the moderator. Yeah, well, that's, well, no, that's it. I'm, <laughs> I talked enough. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll wrap it up and see you at the next COP. Thanks, everybody.